The Indian economy has clearly been the gold medalist of 2023 with a likely 6.5% GDP growth in calendar 23, fastest among large economies. Of course, even the US economy grew by 5% in Q3 and that's helped. But US is expected to slow in 2024 to as low as 1.2% by some estimates. Even global growth is expected to slow by at least half a percentage point versus 2023. So how will India fare? On growth, on interest rates, on rupee? Well, I have with me an elite panel of economists and bankers. Samran Chakraborty, Chief Economist at City, Neeraj Gambhir of Axis Bank, Shantanu Sengupta of Goldman Sachs, and Sakshi Gupta of HDFC Bank. Gentlemen and Sakshi, thank you very much for your time. Uh, hope it's a grand new year uh, for all of you. Let me start with you, Samiran. Uh, uh, exactly that, the growth question. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we've done very well in FY24 with probably 7%. But uh, uh, how's FY25 looking? Will global clouds bring us down drastically? Uh, good morning, Lata. Uh, I think the broad domestic fundamentals on growth are doing quite fine. Uh, Although there is a distinct uh, composition difference that we expect the fourth consecutive year when investment growth will be surpassing consumption growth, which has not happened in India's history uh, in the past. Uh, but there, on the headline growth number, there could be a modest 50 basis point lower GDP growth. Uh, that's primarily because of global growth slowing materially. Uh, city global economists expect uh, global growth to fall from about 2.7% in 2023 to 1.9% in 2024. Uh, that headwind India will have to deal with, and that's primarily the reason why uh, we expect a 50 basis point kind of a slowing in uh, growth in FY25. But Shantanu, let me put in some glo uh, you know domestic constraints as well. One, the fiscal deficit will have to be brought down. That was quite a steroid in the last three years when we did very well. Assuming it comes down to five and a half, that, uh, you know, that kind of capex growth may not be there. And secondly, as of now, there isn't enough conviction that uh, the government capex has handed over the baton to private capex. So, your estimates of growth. Yeah, thanks, Lata. Exactly uh, because of the fiscal drag, we think that growth will be lower. Uh, we are sub 6.5% for fiscal year uh, 25. Uh, we are more optimistic on US growth in particular. Uh, we think that US growth is printing north of 2%. Uh, but given the fiscal drag, uh, and especially the CapEx, uh, you know, as you said very correctly, has to, has to uh, come down. You, know, you cannot have CapEx growth in the region of 25, 30% that you've seen in the last three or four years, this is going to be at best growing at nominal GDP growth rate or maybe even a little bit lower. So the private CapEx recovery in our view is more a second half story than the first half story. The first half story is still going to be uh, elections. And, and therefore, you know, our, our growth estimate is slightly lower than uh, six and a half percent for fiscal year 25. There are a good 60 percent of people in our poll who are expecting between 6.2 and 6.4. Uh, so you have a lot of support, uh, Shantanu. On the same issue, uh, Sakshi, uh, I, I mean, the other point that, uh, uh, do you see private CapEx picking on the baton at all? There seems to be, of course, bits and pieces, but uh, can it really fire growth, private CapEx? Uh, yeah, Lata. So uh, our estimate for next year is for growth at 6.3%. Uh, you know, we, growth is going to slow down from uh, uh, the global slowdown. And of course, we are going to see some amount of fiscal drag. Uh, I think on top of that, you will also see that monetary policy remains tight for at least the first half of the year. And, uh, you know, even if we get rate cuts in the second half, they are going to be very, very gradual. Uh, so all these factors will weigh on growth. I think on the private CAPEX side, uh, you know, I don't think that, you know, in the next uh, two quarters, we are going to see a significant revival, and I think we are, we are not going to see a broad-based pickup in private capex. Mm. Uh, you know, once the election uncertainty is over, I do think that by the second half and towards the end of the second half of next fiscal year, 
you might start seeing more uh, broad based signs of a private capex revival and why i say that is that capacity utilization rates are high in the economy we are going to see a consumption slowdown but not a collapse mm-hmm. so i think there will be a support on the consumption side as well and i think that as you start seeing some slowdown on government capital expenditure it should open up space for private capex to come in uh, to a greater extent but I, I i would say that that story is going to be towards the end of next year not before that time permitting i'll come to the consumption story as well but neeraj before that uh, some of the reserve bank's actions are not exactly helping uh, credit offtake we have seen a spate of uh, deposit rate hikes because the reserve bank has kept near term liquidity very tight we've got a report from uh, samir and you know just a few minutes back uh, pointing out that this year even at the end december 31 we didn't see interbank liquidity going into surplus it was a huge deficit of you know over 1 trillion rupees so are you seeing deposit rates continue to rise and therefore lending rates so lata on liquidity i think uh, samran stake is absolutely on the point uh, you know the government spending has not kicked in as much as expected and which is what kind of leading to the interbank liquidity uh, in the deficit even though the overall uh, system liquidity continues to be about 2 trillion plus surplus so it's lying as government balances with rbi uh, while the government has been spending but if you look at the net difference between the receipts and expenditure uh, i think it is uh, a, a bit sort of muted and uh, expecting uh, that in the jan to march quarter we will see some of the spending come through uh, and if that spending comes through then obviously it will have uh, some bit of a moderating effect on the interbank liquidity deficit otherwise we expect the deficit to continue i think the system liquidity will continue to be in a bit of a tight mode uh, uh, call rates uh, or overnight rates continuing to be at the higher end of the corridor Uh, and that obviously has uh, an impact on the short term rates money market rates as well as the deposit rates so uh, at least for the next 3 months i do feel that the deposit rates are likely to stay a bit elevated uh, particularly on the bulk deposit sides and on the cd rate side where the you know, which is basically a market driven sort of phenomena no, no, ve- i don't no, much- very briefly neeraj do you expect cost of capital for industry to rise uh, in the first half and in the second half how would you say i think it is uh, i don't see a material change from here uh, until the you know until the end of uh, i i would say june at least mm. uh, i see a very range bound bond markets in terms of yields uh, i think deposit rates uh, depending on which part of the deposit segment you look at there could be some movements here and there but broadly it's a very very stable okay. you know rate regime that we are looking at currently okay okay so not uh, uh, endangering cost of capital uh, but uh, samiran let's br- therefore bring the question to rates Oh, you know, the U.S. market is running away with even five expectations of five rate cuts. Uh, your sense about how rates are headed in India, both the official rate and the yields? Uh, so, Lata, uh, monetary policy, in our view, would be a three-stage process in 2024. Uh, the first stage will be where uh, this divergence in banking system liquidity and durable liquidity uh, will. come closer and that would imply that the weighted average call rates will come closer to the repo rate rather than staying at the msf rate so this will be the first stage this should be followed by uh, the change in monetary policy stance as the december policy minutes suggest that this was in active consideration in that meeting uh, so we expect that the stance change happens in april and then with a little bit of lag maybe in august when there is more clarity on the monsoon uh, we see uh, a shallow rate cut uh, happen of about 50 basis point in uh, 2024 uh, that would imply that the softening of monetary policy stance along with the global bond index inclusion related inflows mm. uh, has the potential to take 10 year bond yields down closer towards 6.5% by end of fy 25 is the view that we have right now mm. uh, okay so that mm, explains the rate cuts but you know that will depend on uh, inflation isn't it uh, so shantanu the reserve bank's own forecast is that uh, you know uh, in the uh, cpi inflation in uh, q1 goes down to 5.2 and then it's 4 but comes up again to 4.7 in q3 next year so you know 
added to this is we don't know how this Red Sea issue that's pushing up freight rates and those can have an impact. So, uh, your thoughts on inflation in uh, 24? Yeah, so Lata, the, the first half uh, of the calendar year for us uh, looks not of 5%, closer to 5.5% uh, inflation. It really depends a lot on how food prices uh, behave, uh, especially the perishables, and it's very difficult to have a concrete forecast on that. So you'll have a lot of volatility around those prices. Second half of the calendar year, especially in Q3, is where you'll find uh, inflation coming down, largely due to the base effect of last year, and then rising back up again. Uh, overall, we are projecting, you know, 4.7% for the for the fiscal year 25. But I think on the rates front, overall monetary policy, there's a combination of a friendlier Fed. We are forecasting uh, as Goldman Sachs five rate cuts uh, in in 2024. There's ongoing disinflation. Oil prices are lower than where our forecasts have been earlier. So we have revised our oil price forecasts lower towards 80. Uh, and, you know, we think that U.S. growth is still solid. So you are going to end up probably with uh, quite a bit of flows because of the risk on environment, uh, especially for, for emerging markets. Uh, and that will help ease the liquidity situation Q2 onwards if the RBI chooses to, uh, you know, ease liquidity. So it's very easy at that point of time to absorb dollars in spot and just create uh, liquidity and not keep it as tight as what it is now. In terms of the process, though, I agree with Samiran. It's going to be a process where they first uh, start easing liquidity, then go for a change in stance, and then we also have a pretty shallow uh, rate hiking, rate cutting cycle, only 50 basis points in, in calendar 24. Okay, I'll come to the other economist in a minute. But uh, uh, since you know bond inclusion is so much the conversation, uh, Neeraj, you know how do you expect uh, this to uh, you know impact yields? Do you see a combination of U.S. I mean, of uh, rate U.S. rate cuts and uh, the income coming in of this money and buying away Indian bonds, bringing yields down substantially? I mean, are we seeing uh, sub seven very soon for the ten year, uh, well before June, and does it go all the way down to six and a half rate range this year? So I think for the first uh, half of this calendar year, I think we will be somewhere close to seven to seven quarter. The reason I say this is that we've already seen about eight billion dollars worth of flows in the last year, uh, particularly four and a half billion dollars in the last quarter. Uh, and the bond yields have actually remained very, very stable. They've been very range bound between seven quarter to say seven thirty five, seven forty level. Uh, I don't see this uh, flow of uh, liquidity into the system creating a large downward pressure on the yields as such, because we'll also have supply from the government. Uh, I think the next current, next fiscal borrowing program will start, uh, you know, from April onwards. Uh, in fact, uh, we will have to see what the calendar looks like at the end of uh, February um, and in the budget, what kind of borrowing program the government announces. But the market, you know, there will be supply for market to absorb. Uh, and this extra demand will obviously be spaced out over a period of time. It's not going to be one shot. So I think uh, at this point in time, I don't expect the 7% level to be breached over the next three or four months. Uh, bond yields will largely depend upon what the view on the policy is. And as I hear the economists say that it is likely to be a very shallow uh, rate cutting cycle, maybe biased towards the second half of this year. So as and when that expectation materializes in the market, we could see potentially a move towards six half, six seventy five in the second half of the year. But for the first six months, I think it's uh, in the range of seven to seven quarter. Well, I have to take a break, but uh, how will this large inflow of bond funds into India impact the rupee, impact interest rates? All those questions after the break. Welcome back to Outlook 2024. Our economists expect that growth is going to slow down a wee bit. But uh, the big uh, uh, kind of uh, cat among the pigeons is going to be this bond index inclusion, which could bring in well over 2 lakh crores. And who is to say that we may not be included in the Barclays Bloomberg index as well? And will that mean more inflows? What does that do to the rupee and to interest rates? I have with me Neeraj Gambhir of Axis, Sakshi Gupta of HDFC, Samiran Chakraborty of uh, 
uh, City and Shantanu Sengupta of Goldman to discuss all that. Gentlemen and Sakshi, thank you very much for your patience. Sakshi, just that. What is the Reserve Bank expect to do when this money flows in? Are they, I mean, do you expect MSS bonds, etc.? Uh, and what will it do uh, to interest rates and the rupee? Uh, well, Lata, clearly the central bank over the last two years has maintained the strategy of, you know, building up their reserves. They have been, uh, you know, absorbing a lot of dollar flows. Uh, their intervention on the rupee has been two-sided. And, you know, more recently we've seen that despite the appreciation we've seen in some of our peers, uh, the rupee did not see, uh, you know, a similar amount of appreciation. And that's perhaps due to RBI intervention. Uh, I think that going forward, clearly, yes, with the sheer amount of inflows that are going to come in, both because of the inclusion in the bond index, uh, as well as some amount of, uh, you know, positivity towards India and the emerging market basket, uh, we could see, uh, you know, an appreciation bias for the rupee. Okay. Uh, that being said, I think that the RBI will continue to intervene and absorb uh, some of these dollar inflows because I, I don't think that they would want significant amount of volatility, be it, uh, you know, appreciation or depreciation to come in. Uh, so I, I think that we will see foreign exchange reserves from the central bank uh, uh, go up further next year. Uh, and I don't think that the rupee would uh, appreciate uh, by by a significant amount, Al although there will be an appreciation bias, but I think that we will see some amount of resistance coming in from RBI's intervention of absorbing a lot of these flows. Okay. Uh, I know it's a tough thing to guess, uh, Sakshi, thanks for that. But Samiran, actually a similar question to you. Uh, do you expect that uh, the Reserve Bank may have to take recourse to, you know, MSS or something? Or uh, uh, how will it tackle the likely flow of money and, you know, we've been used to this 83.30 for God knows how long. So I can't even believe there will be a rupee appreciation right now. But in our view, uh, what's happening is that RBI is uh, putting almost equal emphasis on three things, uh, price stability, financial stability, and currency stability. And that's why uh, we're seeing this exceptionally low uh, volatility uh, in the INR markets. Uh, we don't think that's going to change in a very dramatic way uh, in 2024 because RPI has both the willingness as well as the ability to maintain this uh, given the kind of FX reserves that they have. And uh, luckily for us, if our uh, DXY view is correct, that the range for the year is between 102 to 107, uh, then there's no need for a big rupee move uh, to adjust for valuation concerns. Okay. Uh, even the inflation differentials would not uh, suggest something like that. So the RBI can keep on having a relatively tighter uh, range on the currency. Uh, but on your other question on uh, sterilization of these inflows that are going to come, uh, our sense is that about one to one and a half trillion of uh, OMO uh, sales uh, could be required or MSS uh, bonds could be required. Uh, on very tentative assumptions about a small reduction in fiscal deficit for next year, uh, then also there will be enough demand for the borrowing to clear in the market. Mm. Oh, there should be enough demand now that there is another giant set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, investors coming in. Uh, Shantanu, you know, uh, just a word on uh, flows and on current account deficit. Current account deficit is not a problem now, but if the world were to slow, uh, would you say that uh, export growth as well as services, as it is our services uh, exports are only at 28 billion for the last, what, 9, 10 months of this year? Uh, they're not growing. Likewise, ex uh, goods exports, it's around 33 billion. It's not growing beyond that. So, you know, will that be, uh, will we see export growth? And more importantly, uh, what do you th say in terms of capital flows? Yeah, sure, Lata. So, firstly, on the on the export side, services exports was doing about seven percent of GDP on average pre-pandemic period. It does anywhere between nine to ten percent of GDP now. Call it nine and a half. Okay. That is already giving you a buffer. We don't think that that grows much beyond uh, in terms of no, uh, percentage of GDP. So, it's it's reached a peak in terms of percentage of GDP, but even then, it cushions the current account deficit. Uh, you know, that you're running from more the merchandise trade balance side. Added to that, you're having about $100 billion of remittances 
we think that you know, the current account deficit will be uh, less than one and a half percent of GDP. We have a 1.3 percent of GDP projection uh, for for 2024. On flows, I think the the global rates view changing is quite material, uh, right? Because that creates this risk on scenario for emerging markets. And therefore we would expect robust capital flows. One, equity flows probably continues to remain robust with the Fed uh, starts changing. Two, you know, we talked about uh, the GBIM bond inclusion uh, and therefore uh, debt flows. And three, FDI, which has been, uh, uh, you know, quite slow this year, will probably turn around also as cost of capital in, in the dollar markets come down because fundraising was difficult for private markets with dollar rates at five, five and a half percent. Once that starts easing, mm -hmm. you will find more FDI flows as well. So what that will do is that instead of looking at just the GBIM bond inclusion flow in isolation, you'll probably end up with anywhere between 25 to $30 billion of uh, balance of payment surplus. Okay. If if our assumptions on the, on the on the current account is is right, and and that's what the RBI really has to deal with in terms of absorption. Right. Our view is that they go ahead and absorb the flows. They 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 continue to build reserves, uh, and and treat domestic monetary policy separately. Okay. So they'll sterilize or not sterilize depending on what their domestic right. monetary policy requirements yeah. are. Uh, Samir, and it's just that consumption hasn't picked up. I can see that even in the forecast of you and Shantanu and Sakshi, that uh, 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 people will invest, capex will grow ultimately if uh, consumption grows, and the K-shaped uh, recovery seems clearly not uh, uh, leading to that. Uh, do you think that will come? And more importantly, do you think tax-to-GDP ratio is rising so much that the government can do both, capex as well as do a lot of uh, income transfers. Let's I'll try to be brief. Uh, on consumption side, uh, I think we are uh, seeing some slowdown trends in urban consumption. While uh, there are some green shoots on the rural side, I don't want to overemphasize them and wait to see how the rubby crop performs uh, before calling for a full-fledged rural recovery. Uh, but hopefully with the rural picking up, we see some uh, uh, the overall improvement in uh, consumption. But you are absolutely right that uh, finally, uh, the private capex recovery should lead to more job growth, more income growth, and that would be a more durable basis for consumption, uh, con consumption growth. And the tax to GDP part, I think the problem is not so much the tax to GDP. The, the challenge for the government is to reduce the fiscal deficit from 5.9% of GDP to 4.5% of GDP uh, in two years' time, that 70 basis point of uh, correction every year. Uh, and if you look at uh, the pre-pandemic versus the current uh, fiscal numbers, uh, what strikes you is that the entire sort of increase in fiscal deficit is coming because of capex to GDP increasing from 1.7% to 3.3%. That's a good quality expenditure you don't want to reduce. And to reduce the revenue expenditure or to increase the tax to GDP substantially uh, is, is going to be a very challenging task. There is a silver bullet always, which is uh, divestment, asset monetization, et cetera, uh, which can uh, plug this hole. Uh, but overall, it's difficult to sustain uh, this kind of expenditure growth uh, with this deficit reduction target in mind. Thank you very much, Samir, and thank you all of you for packing in so much in such a short time. Uh, the important message is growth will be a little slower, but at 6.2%, we will still be one of the fastest growing economies and definitely the fastest growing large economy in the world. Uh, but it'll be an interesting year with a possible rate cut from the Fed and a huge bond-related uh, inflow into the country. Thank you very much for watching this special edition of Outlook 2024, Indian Economy.